Hello everyone, this is Tim, and this is going to be the last recap of the House Roderick, A Song of Ice and Fire campaign. The, the game ended last uh, Saturday, so this will be the last time I'm talking about it. We started off with the inner dialogue of my character being mixed between the maesters and his own thoughts and emotions. And at sort of in the middle of this campaign, my character took on the name of uh, the Nameless Man because his name means nothing. When you sign up to be a faceless man, you forget your own old life, you try to move on, you try to literally train yourself to not think of yourself as yourself. You, you think of yourself as someone who is nothing, someone who becomes that which he places onto himself. You take on the guise, you take on the emotions, the personality of whoever you're playing, whoever you're trying to pretend to be, and that's who you are at the moment, which made it kind of difficult to <laughs> do these recaps sometimes. But So my character has the maester's face on, and he is trying to be the maester at this point in the story. Zig fast forward the game for a few days, and Brander is missing. Since the last time that we uh, had the campaign, different characters are wondering what's going on. There's lots of family members turning up dead, there's the weddings and the funerals that need to be figured out, uh, there's a murderer running around, so there's a lot of things that they're trying to, to, to hold together for these weddings and such to, to happen. Um, the maester visited Almer, the maester is me, and he gave him dream wine to try to ease the pain, and I planted Brander's flail underneath Almer's bed, because Almer was the one that I was supposed to kill. That's what I had figured out from the, the coin being slid under his bed last time. So I was starting to put together these little plots to try to kill him. And the idea of putting the murder weapon underneath the bed, sort of planting it for later, would be, you know, just in case someone searched me, the, we the weapon wouldn't be on my person. It would be hidden in the room. As long as I can get into the room, I could probably kill him. So that, that was my thought processes. Alina, uh, played by Ru here learned that Brander had given alms or the coin in the north, and that started her wheels turning a little bit because she had talked to alms and he told her, and alms is the wildling. Um, she went to go get the coin from Nathan because he had been sort of obsessing over it, not wanting to get let go of it, you know, clasping it in his hand. Nathan was very upset. He had the pieces of his Savas board out, and one of the pieces was broken, and all the other pieces were scattered all over the floor. Um, he was hyperventilating, hyperventilating <laughs> just over and over again, talking about this broken piece, saying that Brander is gone. It is a different game now. He uh, didn't want to give Alina the piece, and she sort of forced her way to, you know, try to, you know, step up and talk down to him, and he wasn't having having it. So she dragged him to Marcus to basically have him demand the coin. When they got to Marcus, there was an old man who was being introduced to uh, Marcus who was going to do the, the weddings and the funerals, and he was known as the caretaker. Now in the north, when you worship the old gods, there really isn't a, a hierarchy or anyone really who does certain things, but this person was the one that was going to do it. He was just going to talk about things and uh, just basically uh, preside over the, the ceremonies. This old caretaker had brought with him a weirwood tree in a large pot that was supposed to symbolize life and death, and also because Bearhold did not have a weirwood tree as of that time. Alina and Marcus were talking about uh, the coin that Nathan had, and Marcus demanded the coin be given to Alina. It had left an impression in his hand, and it's like a square coin. Uh, I went as the maester to talk to, to Nathan as he fled from the, the, the common area, the, the throne room, I guess, as it was. Um, later, I feel like Alina wanted to have the coin, but my character convinced her to give him the coin so that he could do some more research, and then when he was done, he would return the coin and the book to her. Now, the book details some things from the Essos across the Narrow Sea, 
But that actually didn't happen. It got, kind of got fast forward over, and that, that was a little bit of a jump there. I probably should have brought that back up. But what ended up happening is that uh, the coin and the book stayed with me until they went and ended up in Nathan's hands, which we'll get to next. I had gone to Nathan's room, and I started picking up the pieces and putting them on this Voss board. And he was you know, talking about a lot of things, and I was sort of ignoring him. Uh, he was talking about the broken piece, and uh, instead of putting the broken piece, the last piece on the board, I instead put the Verbosi coin that I had gotten from Alina back on the board itself. And Nathan noticed that, and it sort of calmed him down. That, that just having the coin again, you know, brought him back to to a level of uh, just calmness that he didn't have previously. And I started to reveal that I, you know, I wasn't the maester. I was acting like Brander, uh, messing up his hair, things that that Brander had done before. And it was kind of a cool scene. I, you know, I I liked the fact that I revealed my secret to Nathan first because our characters had had a sort of bonding moment a few times in the past uh, you know we're, we're both sort of bookish and uh, a little bit of an outcast kind of strange and you know bizarre so you know that was a kind of a cool moment I, you know I like that moment when I put that piece on the board I just I don't, I'm gonna remember that for a long time I think uh, there was this vision of Nathan holding the coin you know as I as I did this and pointing to who I should kill. Uh, you know, he pointed to the fisherman that had died, uh, the one with the, the the string around his throat from the very beginning of the campaign. Uh, he gestured to another man in the woods that I killed, and I broke his neck. Um, he pointed to, uh, to to Edgum, and he said, had set that up. He wanted Almer dead. And the whole purpose of this is that Nathan looked at our family, saw the weak points, and wanted to eliminate them. He's very strategic, and he just didn't want all these people causing problems that would bring the name of their house down. Um, so I came back out of that vision of Nathan, and we sort of fast-forwarded three days. Now, Zig has been trying to sort of end the campaign for a couple of sessions, so uh, this was a good way to you know get things moving, get to the parts that he wanted to get to. Uh, Glover had returned to Bearhold with 20 soldiers that you know Marcus had asked for, and Alina as well. The Mormons had arrived with House Rain, but these are our rivals, people that uh, we're trying to contend against for the the ownership and rule of Bear Island. So whenever Eunice heard this, you know he was like, "What? What? What do you mean House Rain's here? The Mormons as well?" And the Mormons were sort of uh, dismissing Marcus, not really being very warm to him, not really even introducing themselves to him, introducing themselves to common people first to sort of slight Marcus. And I thought Zig did that really well. I uh, just pointed out that there's some bad blood there and you know it's not to the point where it's open warfare but it's getting there. Tensions are high. Um, Marcus was watching these guests arrive uh, with sort of this like stern uh, overlook you know just making sure that people could see him and that he could see them but uh, being someplace where they couldn't really converse with him at first. He wanted to sort of, sort of uh, just say how, how he was, what he was thinking, uh, putting forth that image of a strong rulership, I guess. So the Mormons and Reigns had showed up. Uh, Meiji Reign, or I'm sorry, Meiji Mormont was there. She had fraying uh, hair, it was gray, uh, heavy set woman, big legs, strong arms. Uh, her daughter, Daisy Mormont, was there. Uh, she was well-built, but she was more um, strong and lithe, I guess. Most of them, the procession of the Mormons and Reigns were wearing armor and weapons, proving that uh, they weren't feeling all that comfortable about being here. Rathew Rain, he was also there with red hair, uh, strong, just uh, wanting to end this conflict, wanting to end the blockade of his areas so that his... Uh, you know, people could come into his place and leave his lands. Um, so when Marcus greeted Rathew, he sort of grabbed him, grabbed him by the hand and pulled himself in, uh, just basically showing that they're, you know, trying to intimidate him, I guess, a little bit into, you know, who was the, the more powerful house. Um, let's see here. I'll take a little break. 
After Marcus had introduced himself, kind of, to these people that had come in, he walked around and realized there was like three times the number of people that are in bear hole than normal. Lots of money was coming in, lots of peasants. The peasants' tourney was was bringing in tons of people. Uh, you know, the the small folk getting a chance to show their prowess, and all these you know, small. Uh, insignificant people were sort of elevated for a day so it gave somebody uh, a chance to to prove their worth to their betters as it were uh, Todrick Frostfoot came down or Todrick Red Tree depending on how you want to look at it they their name is sort of interchangeable came down from the north with ten guards and soldiers and he you know was there for the for the battles for the, for the lists and, and various competitions that they were going to have Todrick offered his uh, men to Marcus to help protect the 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 guard to protect the area of Bearhold because their soldiers were off trying to fix the Wood Tower lands. Um, I told Nathan, my character, to act badly so that Almer's guards could be told to go take care of him and to guard him to watch him so that he would be um, unprotected. And Nathan also, you know, I think I forgot that part. Nathan had revealed to my character what was going on. That he, you know, once Almer was dead, he had no more use of me. That all the weakness would be purged from the house. So we sort of worked together to try to make that happen. Um, I killed the first guard after <laughs> after the persuasion uh, botch. Totally, I just I, I didn't make that happen at all. But I twisted his neck around and I charged into the room and. The quickest, easiest way to kill him was to push him out the window. And this was interesting because I did this kind of on purpose. Uh, I, I pushed him out the window so that someone would see his body fall and that it, you know my attempt to kill Almer might end badly. This was my sort of attempt to weave in tragedy into what was going on. And it turned out that that actually happened. I was, you know, I was like, oh, that's great. You know, part of me was like, Oh, I want to, you know, I want to make sure I pull this off. But the other part of me was like, oh, this is going to be great if this totally botches and blows up in my face, and it did. So he fell out of the window. All these people that are gathering for this wedding, all these soldiers and so forth, see it, and Alina charges the wall, climbs up the window, and comes comes bolting in. Meanwhile, Marcus is running around, going up the stairs, coming up, and coming down the hallway the other way. So my character had just enough time. To leave the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I forgot the best part. I had charged into the room, knocked on, killed these guards, and Almer was there with his twisted, broken legs, barely awake. I took this flail, swung it up over my head, and smashed it right down into his face, uh, like Braveheart style. And I left the the flail there, still smashed into his head, just to sort of show that you know Brander did this, because my plan was to pretend. You know, I'm the maester, I'm not Brander, you know, Brander must have done that. And also that Brander was going to assault me. So I ran out into the hallway, and my plan was to smash myself in the eye several times with a doorknob to make it look like someone had punched me. But they had climbed the wall so fast and came up the other side so fast that I was mid-process. So I was right by the door, I just whacked myself in the eye. They were both looking at me, seeing what was going on. Alina had seen the body of Almer with a smashed face, so I had tried to slam the door and, you know, basically put the door between me and them. Alina had thrown the axe and wedged it between the door and uh, where it was going to close, so it couldn't close all the way. And then Marcus came in and just kicked the door right in, and it, it smashed me in the face as well. So I stumbled back towards the window. So in the, in that room, we were all, you know, people were yelling at me like uh, Lena saying I'm a murderer and, uh, you know, I'm going to die. And she, I don't remember everything she said, but she was very heated. Uh, she swung the axe right into my shoulder. Uh, Marcus saw me there and he punched me right in the gut as hard as he could. I jumped back into the window and held on. And I, was, I looked around like, am I going to jump? Am I going to try to climb? Am I going to go down the windowsill? And I decided that I'm going to try to climb under the roof and get somewhere else and just try to get away from them. Because at this point, they think the maester had done it. So I was going to put on the brander face on the other side of the castle 
and pretend like I had just arrived, but it didn't happen that way. <laughs> uh, Eunice and, and Marcus, they just, uh, you know, he had his character run forward and just, just plow right into me, and just both of us went hurling out of the window, down two stories. Marcus was on top of me, and my body just, just landed as hard as it could right into the ground with all these people around us. Alina started climbing down. So the guards were there. Uh, they had put their spears into me. Marcus had me, you know, by the, the back. He had me in a headlock. And he just started walking me towards the bear pit, just slowly and methodically. Just punching me and saying, like, Edgar Roderick assassinated. Lord Edgar, you know, Roderick assassinated. Just keep punching me, you know, like, uh, Alma Roderick assassinated. Boom, you know. And he just slowly walking, and you know the whole thing was pretty, pretty cool. And you know, part of me again was sort of like, oh, I don't want to give up just yet, but you know, I just I went with it. There really wasn't much I could do. I was surrounded. Uh, so in the end, you know, uh, <laughs> Marcus just points at the master of the pit, release the bear, and then he just hurled my body down into the uh, into the pit, and I just kept muttering to myself, uh, "It is finished." Basically. I had done my task. The people that were meant to die had died. It was time for me to, to meet my own death. So with the guise of this old man, Maester, I was hurled down into the pit. The, the bear gate started to rise slowly. The only weapon I had was the chains of the Maester that were around my neck. So I grabbed half of them all in one hand and half of them in the other and I just started swinging these chains that are not meant to be weapons around my head, uh, uh, screaming, you know, it is finished, it is finished. I, I, I ripped off the, the maester's face and I threw it at Marcus. Uh, and there was this <gasps> sort of this shocked moment, all this crowd that has, had gathered. And they saw this skull looking face with like this black liquid uh, goo film all over it. And then as the next step I did is I pulled out Brander's face and I put it back on my own and smoothed it out. And this is when Alina saw it and she started to cry. She realized that Brander, this person that she had loved, is now either dead or had murdered her family. So in the end, the bear uh, and, and me fought. I was whacking in the face with chains, but it was ineffective. And I just kept saying, it is finished. It is finished. Father! And I was just getting ripped to pieces by this bear. And the bear, you know, killed me. And you know, I, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a really pretty epic scene. And Marcus was uh, sort of turning around, looking at the crowd, saying that, uh, you know, once the bear has finished eating, you know, kill it and burn it. The curse dies with it. Basically saying that, you know, you know Brander and all of the things that he had done uh, hopefully would be purged by killing and burning the bear. Uh, the sins would be, you know, forgiven, would be, uh, you know, washed away. Uh, the, they could move on with their lives. So all that was going on. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Um, in the end, it was basically, you know, I'm dead. Uh, the wedding was set up to be, to happen. There was the funeral of all the, the family members. Alina was going to marry... Um, <laughs> Lord Glover and she was going to go to Deepwood Mott and then we were sort of joking because we knew the history of the campaign where the Ironborn were going to you know, basically take over that place in the future so she was going to have some Ironborn to deal with uh, she wanted to take Marianne with her but that uh, didn't end up happening Marianne ended up going north to the Frostfoots and being fostered there um, and Marcus eventually married Alyssa Woodtower and they had gone off to the Wood Tower lands and made that their headquarters so that Marcus could continue to plot to take over Bear Island. So that was pretty much everything that happened. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was a great campaign. I really enjoyed all the things that Zig did. If you ever get a chance as a player to let loose the, the reins a little bit and have the GM be able to mess with your character in some ways, maybe mess with your background, I highly recommend it. It was a nice surprise when these little tidbits kept popping up through the campaign. I had told Zig at the beginning that I wanted to play uh, maybe a serial killer that didn't realize what he was doing. You know, he was a serial killer. You know, when he had these few blackout states, and then he would just be whoever he was normally. And Zig took that 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 concept, made it a faceless man, came up with Nathan commanding me to to kill these people, 
And uh, it was just a great campaign. I really enjoyed playing with Eunice and Ro Rohir. Um, good time, guys. Zig, it's always a pleasure to be a, a player in your games. All right, my son woke up from his nap a little while ago, so I'm going to cut this short. All right, everybody, thanks for listening. This will be the last video of this series. Thanks.